Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by saying thank you for attending our webinar today. I am Jeff Weaver, an automation specialist with CNE Sales, and I will be the presenter today. Today's webinar is intended to discuss and illustrate uh, Profinet, how it is used within TIA portal and in conjunction with Siemens hardware such as the S7 1500 distributed I.O. and Ethernet switches. The concepts will start with basic and move to, I guess we'll call it more advanced. Hopefully it will uh, build in a logical fashion for you one concept upon another so that we don't uh, just leapfrog two or three at once. And the entire configuration will use TIA Portal. So just a, an overview, I'm going to try and keep the presentation portion short. We're going to focus on Profinet features and TIA. Uh, Profinet is a name-based network configuration, and we'll certainly cover that. The concept is that uh, each device will have a name, and the name is easier to remember than the IP address, and the IP address will actually get assigned by the I.O. controller. We will look briefly at prioritized fast startup. That's essentially just a checkbox. And most of our processors will support uh, 64 nodes that are set to prioritize fast startup. This would allow a node, if it were powered down and back up, to potentially restart and be back online in under a second. We will cover system diagnostics, which are built into the firmware of the S7-1500, as well as our 1200 PLCs. We will show how those integrate within the HMI and the web server, the PLC, and the software. Additionally, we'll show how to perform some programmed diagnostics. System diagnostics are free and excellent, but there may be some additional information that you would like to have as a programmer. We'll cover how that works, and some of the ones we're looking at today are pretty simple. We're going to look at simple device replacement, one of the most powerful features within Profinet, and this is a, a feature that allows you to replace a failed node of distributed I.O. Uh, without any configuration, without any laptop, just simply a plug-and-play solution. And that does require uh, Siemens, or at least a managed switch within the Siemens family, and we'll cover that. Then we will look at topologies within Ethernet and how you could configure a ring. And the protocol that Siemens uses, or the one we'll illustrate today, is Media Redundancy Protocol, MRP. And that's a pretty simple setup, and we'll look at that. And once we configure MRP, we'll see, and you'll see the need for us to have a little more diagnostics so that we can diagnose cable faults and act when the cable has faulted before the next cable faults and we lose a node or an entire system. So we're going to do that with SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, which is an open standard, and uh, our PLC can pull SNMP data out of the Ethernet-based devices that we use today. So this is our agenda. First thing we're going to cover is just an intro to the Siemens controllers. Uh, this may be review for you. I just want to make sure we're not flying in uh, without any information on the product line. So basically, we've simplified for the controllers that we support or that we offer. We have a basic family, which is the 1200. That is a uh, classic brick PLC, meaning the I.O. is integrated. And as we get into more advanced functionality, we move into the S7-1500 platform. Um, these guys also have safety integrated. Both of those platforms, you can, um, you can buy a safety version of that processor. Uh, there are security options. Uh, sometimes those are external modules, and sometimes they're built right into the CPU. And we're not going to delve too deeply into that, but if you do have those questions, we can answer them or, um, or give us a call as well. Uh, now, this picture shows the basic line of controllers. There's a little bit more to it than this, but uh, the advanced controller, the S7-1500, uh, that's the one we're going to demonstrate today. Uh, within that family, we have... F processors for safety. We also have motion processors, which are T processors. 
The 1500, however, is a motion processor, and there are only a couple of functions that the T is needed to uh, needed for to uh, use with a motion application. The S7 1200 is the more basic PLC, uh, less power, less memory, uh, less overall I/O, but quite powerful, and you can distribute from the 1200 over Profinet or Profibus or even both. Uh, the distributed controller down here in the lower right, uh, that is this guy, the, the distributed controller, is really an S7-1500 in a different footprint. This is also the I.O. platform we're going to work with today, although it's not the controller version. Then we also have a 1500 soft controller, which is, of course, a PC-based controller. And we also have an ODK 1500 processor, which would actually allow us to program in uh, C++. So there's a quick overview of the families. Uh, within the 1500, we have security integrated, where we can protect blocks, we can protect the program, uh, we can bind the program to a memory card such that uh, that memory card can be duplicated and not work in any other uh, PLC. Uh, I did just briefly mention 1500, 1200 differences. Um, the 1500 does support a require memory card. It's a Siemens memory card. However, it does not need a battery. And that memory card is an SD card, although it is, again, a Siemens memory card. The 1200 does not require it, although there's value in adding the, the memory card. The IEC 611.31.3 uh, programming languages are supported. So that's an international standard. That's a ladder, function block diagram, statement list, not to be confused, confused with structured text. The statement list is more of an assembly language. In the 1500s, there's not a great advantage in STL like there was in the 300 and 400 plant families. SCL, source code language, that is exactly what structured text is. It's really based upon Pascal. And then we have a graph routine, which is very good for repetitive operations. It's a flowchart style um, programming language with, language with steps and transitions. I mentioned technology integrated. Uh, that is built in with or without a TCPU. Uh, safety integrated, you would have to, to purchase an FCPU to use safety integrated. We can distribute safety out of the Profinet port, the Ethernet port, and uh, mix and match safe and non-safe I.O. It's a very seamless integration. Uh, diagnostics are built into the firmware, so even when the CPU is in stop mode, you're still getting diagnostic data. And again, not a complete family lineup here. We actually have um, these last three over here in the technology CPUs. Uh, we actually have TF versions of those CPUs now as well. 1511, 15, and 17 all come in a TF variety. So that if you needed safety and the T processor, you could get both. And you see our F CPUs. We do have compact CPUs. Um, those are with I.O. integrated. And you can see the memory sizes continue to climb as you get larger and larger. Notice the speed on the bit performance. There's an astronomical one nanosecond for bit operations in a 1518. Very high-powered CPUs. So introduction to Portal. This is the software that programs all of it. And by all of it, I mean the, the HMI, the drives, uh, Simicode, which is some of our motor management, where actually uh, you might use Simicode devices inside of an MCC, and then of course the PLC and the distributed I.O. What packages do we need? If we're programming the S7-1500, we need Step 7 Professional version 14, which is TIA version 14. If you were also programming a comfort panel, which is our main line of panels, advanced panels, you would need WinCC Comfort version 14. Those packages all install inside of the TIA portal framework. So when you install these packages, you still only have one program or application you're running, and that is TIA portal. It's just a question of what functionality will exist inside of portal. Additionally, we have the start drive, which for those of you who used starter in the past, it's basically starter integrated inside of portal, where we can configure drive parameters. Uh, we also have the ability to integrate scalp for the higher end motion products platforms or applications inside of portal. 
And then uh, notice the yellow here, that's where we would add safety if we were doing a safety PLC. So there is a safety add-on to portal if we're going to do a safety PLC. So introduction to Profinet. Again, I'm going to not spend long on this, but I do want to introduce it for anyone who's not super familiar. Uh, the first, <coughs> excuse me, first thing I would uh, start with, I guess, would be that this is Ethernet. IEEE 802.3 is the Ethernet standard. And Ethernet over time has just increased in both speed as well as proliferation in the marketplace. And the two standards we're really focused on and that really matter the most for Ethernet, I, IEEE 802.3 and then the 7498-1 which is the OSI 7 layer model. The model really helps us understand how communication works within Ethernet as well as applications. Profinet is Ethernet. So we, we say that. It's very confusing at times. But Profinet is really just an application very much like HTTP, HTTPS, or Telnet, any of those applications that are running over Ethernet cabling. And Ethernet cabling and um, devices would incorporate uh, your switches, your cables, your NIC cards. So that is Ethernet and it is an Ethernet based network so it can run in conjunction with other Ethernet based protocols. Profinet IO is the Ethernet based automation standard for Siemens and it is uh, again an Ethernet based network. So here we see HTTP, SNMP, socket comms, uh, Profinet, all of those happening up here at layer 7 within our 7 layer model. Ethernet itself is really only the first two layers, one and two, the physical and data link layer. Uh, and for those who like to try to memorize this, uh, there's lots of acronyms. One of my favorite is, please do not take sales person's answers. So I probably get in trouble for saying that, but <clears throat> nonetheless, that's the seven layer model. Kind of a fast intro. Profinet operates down here at layers one and two and the Ethernet realm. And that gives it great efficiency, but it also allows it to work with other protocols. Here's a, a standard, well, this is maybe not standard, but just kind of an illustration of some of the things we could do within Profinet. Here's an S7-1500 PLC. ET200MP is a distributed I.O. platform. Here's another 1500. We can also use Scalance access points or wireless devices. Scalance is the Siemens brand for Ethernet-based uh, switching and wireless products. In this case, we're wireless down to a distributed I.O. node. And we could even join to a Profibus-based network. Uh, the general concept behind the Profinet system, and for whatever reason, number two is missing, you have a, an I.O. controller, which is typically the PLC. It doesn't have to be. It could be PC-based. But it's typically the PLC, and it is in our examples. And you'll have I.O. devices. So the I.O. device will then communicate with the I.O. controller. We can share that device among multiple I.O. controllers, and we can take another controller, actually, and turn that into a Profinet device as well. So it's a pretty flexible network. Uh, but today, we're really just going to focus on uh, the PLC with a device and then topologies. The concept of device name is to make it easier to remember, but it also uh, simplifies some things for us on the configuration side. So when we set up an IP address, we're not going to set that up in the device. We're going to set that up in our TIA portal or our Step 7 version 14 configuration. That configuration gets downloaded to the PLC. So the PLC then has all the information about IP address, and it's going to look for the device name. What we have to do as programmers and developers, we have to assign separately the device name to each node. And then once the PLC, which has this configuration, sees that device name, it will write into the device its IP address, and then it will also write in its parameters. Once it's finished with parameters, it will then enter I.O. exchange, a real-time I.O. So that was a brief intro to Profinet. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to ask, and uh, hopefully we can answer those here at the end of the show. So this is our initial configuration. I'm going to build up uh, just a simple config to start. 
This is going to be an S7-1500 PLC connected to an ET200SP I.O. node. And we're going to just simply take one input from that node and bring it back to the PLC. Okay, I've switched screens so that we can uh, build this configuration over in uh, Portal. So here's our TIA Portal uh, shortcut. If I launch that, here is TIA Portal, the, the project view, or sorry, the portal view. Project view is down here on the left. So I'm going to create a new project here. gave it a name of webinar one. You do not have to have underscores. And at this point from portal view I can configure devices, um, add, add HMIs, PLCs, the works. I prefer to switch immediately over to this project view, which as engineers is much more familiar to us. This is a project tree. And I'm going to um, normally would add a new device here, select the controller, select the 1500 that I'm going to use, uh, the processor I happen to be using is 1515T, and then add it to the project. Right now I'm not going to do that because for the sake of time I've pre-configured a few objects just to um, eliminate some of the unnecessary time. So I'm, I'm going to use my global library which I've pre-configured. You see down here in the lower right and this library uh, allows me to store, could be programming blocks, tags, HMI screens, entire configurations. Just about anything I configure in my project I can store in a library, which is excellent for sharing among multiple people or even from project to project with the same developer. So I've got my initial folder and I'm going to over here in my project tree, open up devices and networks. And I'm going to drag the processor right out to the network view. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to drag my HMI to the network view. And then I'm also going to drag the distributed I.O. node, which is the ET200SP family, to the network view. So now those have been added to my project. You'll notice here in the project tree, I have 1500 PLC and HMI. To connect the HMI to the Profinet network, I'm simply going to drag its Ethernet port to the Profinet network, and it is connected. Now I have these IPs pre-configured, the IP addresses, so that helps. So if I look here at my IP addresses, I'll see this. these guys have already been pre-configured. So just a time saving, but it also illustrates when you set up a standard configuration, put it in your library, it'll bring the parameters including the IP addresses with it. So you notice the ET200SP is not assigned. Now what that means is it does not have an I.O. controller to report to or communicate with. And the reason for that, the reason it did not just default and communicate with this PLC is that this project is capable of having, having many PLCs. So I could have six or seven PLCs and I would have to choose which PLC was going to control this I.O. node. So in this case we only have the one, so I'm going to select port one. This particular PLC actually has two NICs in it. I'm not going to use the second NIC today, so that's a separate IP address. And you'll notice uh, when I, I selected it, I now have the 1515TJW is now showing up as my controller for this particular node. You also see the dashed line. That indicates the I.O. network. And you'll notice the HMI does not have a dashed line. The HMI is not a Profinet device. It can be. It is possible to add it as a Profinet device potentially um, adding some high-speed push buttons that would be Profinet based push buttons but in most cases it is simply connected to the network it's not a Profinet device. Here my node is already configured or at least connected and I'm going to look at the configuration so I double click on this node 
and you'll see I have my uh, input cards, output. If I look at the configuration for this node, I'll see there's a discrete in, 16 points, discrete out, an analog in, four, and an analog out. If I were modifying this configuration, I could move this uh, server module, which does have to be present. That's the end module. And then in my hardware catalog, I could simply add whatever module I needed. So there's a discrete point, discrete eight point, and I could drop that in. So it is now configured. But I don't need that. That's not my actual config. So I will delete that module and move the server module back to where it belongs in slot five. So that is, that is now configured. If I switch back to network view, and I click on the node itself inside of the box there. Notice this name, ET200SP-Node. That is the Profinet device name. And I'll show you how that's configured uh, internally. Now that's a correctly named device. And what I mean by correctly named is Profinet does not support underscores or spaces in the names or special characters. However, if you choose to put those in your name, you can get away with that, and the software will generate a different name in the background. That is correct. So if I scroll down into the properties, here's where it's generating the name for me, and because the name is correct already, it keeps that name. I prefer to do it this way, but you can put in a different name, and it will generate a different name for you. So I'll give you an example. Device 1 is not a valid name, but if I look at what happened in the Profinet settings, it's going to use this name in the background to assign to the device. I prefer my names to be correct, but uh, the software does handle that for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're back to a correct name. I believe I pre-configured a tag here, but I'll double check. Yeah. So if I look at the tags within my PLC, I've configured one called push button, and that tag corresponds to the address I0.0. .0. If I look at my ET200SP node, I will see my discrete input starts at address 0. So that is the very first input, I0.0, .0 on that module. Also, for the sake of illustration, in my HMI, I configured an object on screen. That will illustrate or will animate based upon that push button. So when the push button is pressed, we will see this green circle. And that's based upon the tag push button one that I just showed you in the PLC. Okay, so I'm going to download the configuration of the PLC now. So if I select the PLC, select my download, and I selected the PLC first because, again, I could have multiple devices. If I was inside of the HMI and I hit the download button, it's going to then attempt to download to the HMI. So it's important to note that the first time you open up a portal, you will be greeted with the extended download. You select your interface, in our case PNIE1 is the network everything is connected to. Select the start search, and it should go out and find all the devices we're connected to and that match this PLC that I'm trying to download to. And here's the CPU. If I had multiple CPUs, I could flash the LEDs. Doing now and my CPU is splashing and that would help me to identify which device I'm communicating to. So I select the PLC, select load, and then here it's going to drop the program into the PLC.
Now you can't see the PLC from your perspective. However, when it's done, my PLC will have a fault light because it is not yet communicating with the I.O. node. Okay, so now if I switch to the network view, select my PLC, choose Go Online, you see that my I.O. node is not reachable. Now the reason for that is I have not assigned the name to the device yet. So the name is assigned within the project and the PLC contains a configuration looking for this IP or this name. As soon as it sees that name, it's going to push in the IP address 172.16.15.21. So how do I assign the name? Simply right click on the Profinet network, select assign device name, choose my ET200SP device. I like to check the box, only show devices of the same type, update the list. Now I should see the device and it does not have at this point device name in it. So you can see no IP address and no device name. So I'll select assign name. Now you can't see this but I will get a solid green on both the PLC and the I.O. node uh, which I now have on both. If I update this screen you will see the device name, but you'll also see now the IP address has been assigned. Again, that happened from the PLC. So now the IP is taken care of, and we are communicating. So if I go online with the device or the PLC, you can see everything is happy. Green checks. And if I select the HMI, and I'm going to start the simulator. This way you can see how the HMI is responding. And I do get a nuisance message about uh, too many device tags because I don't have a tag license installed, but that's not a big issue. So what I've used here is a little slide-in window to perform my navigation. So I'll switch to topology. And this is just a graphical view. There's a message. There's a graphical view of how I'm connected. And if I select my push button, there's my push button. So that's directly on the I.O. node. So there's our basic Profinet configuration. Again, we started with a device name, assigned the name um, after having downloaded the PLC configuration. You certainly could assign the name and then download the PLC config. That works as well. But for this demonstration, I thought it was nice to see the IP address get assigned <coughs> once the PLC, uh, once the device name was loaded and the PLC found the device. Okay, so there's our initial configuration. And now we're going to show just the, an overview of Siemens Ethernet switches. The reason I'm moving to the switches is because the next step is to show simple device replacement. And to perform system, simple device, actually sorry, I'm doing system diagnostics first. So I'm going to add in the switch for this. So here is my uh, XB200, and that's where this family lies. Actually, we're uh, the Siemens switches, once you hit the 200 level and higher, you have a managed switch. The XB200 is Profinet aware, or can be. Uh, I'd like to point out the XB200, and we have other switches. The next level up is the XC200, much more IT capabilities, such as VLANing. However, the XB200, you can order pre-configured for Ethernet IP or for Profinet. Now they can always be changed once you receive the switch, but the benefit of the pre-configured is if you have an, <coughs> excuse me, an Ethernet IP network, which many of you have dealt with, the IGMP snooping issue or the multicast traffic issue, that will bring down your networks. The XB200 comes pre-configured for Ethernet IP. It's very competitive price-wise, and you can drop that into your configuration, plug into the XB200, and never configure it. Just let it sit there like an unmanaged switch, and it will sort out your IGMP tra snooping traffic, or your multicast traffic, I should say, with the IGMP snooping enabled. 
Uh, this is what the switches actually look like, the ones that we're working with today. The XB200, the XC200 is more hardened, has a, a jacketed protection around the RJ45. These switches can come fiber or copper or combo, like you see here on the XB205. <coughs> but we're using just the, the XB208. That switch is configurable with um, web-based management, so just a web server, uh, web browser. It is also configurable via the serial port, the console port. Uh, you can actually use command line interface via the console port or via one of the uh, Ethernet-based ports. So if you're used to configuring Cisco's with CLI, you can do that with these switches as well. So with that mentioned, we're going to move over to system diagnostics. So system diagnostics, what does that include? System diagnostics uh, will include, it depends on the device, it will include things like uh, loss of voltage, module failure, uh, could be short circuit uh, protection, open wire protection or information, uh, loss of node, so if a distributed I.O. node drops out, that information is in the processor without any configuration. Additionally, the same information is available to the HMI, to the web server, inside of the portal software, and um, also on the actual face of the PLC, which you guys won't be able to see, but it is the same information. <coughs> so with that, I'm going to go ahead and configure system diagnostics. Actually, we're going to configure simple device replacement and then system diagnostics. So we'll cover both concepts first. So what is simple device replacement? Well, here's an example where I've lost an I.O. node, I.O. number three. So the I.O. node uh, gets replaced by plant maintenance then utilizing a couple of protocols that are already in existence in the background, LLDP, Link Layer Discovery Protocol, and uh, Siemens Discovery and Config Protocol, we are able to reassign automatically from the PLC the IP address, uh, well, the name first and then the IP address. So what is required? To do that, we're going to need a 200-level switch or higher, and there are some third-party switches that support this feature, but I'm not an expert in those particular switches, but with Siemens, any of our 200 level and higher would support the feature. Now what we'll have to do within the program project is we're going to have to configure topology. And topology is very specific. So now I don't just connect the switch to the network or the node to the network. I actually configure which port on the CPU connects to the switch and which port on the ET200SP node connects to the switch. So it's very specific as far as ports. So with that said, I'm going to switch over to, to portal and we'll add in the next layer. Okay, I've switched back to portal. I'm going to again use my library to add in my switch, simple device replacement library, and I drag that to my network view. Now this switch could also be added if you were doing this you know, without the library the first time from network components in the hardware catalog, the X200 and the XB200 family, and there's the XB208. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we can drag that out to the, the network view. So this becomes, the XP208 now becomes an I.O. device in the network. So I'm going to go ahead and connect it to my PLC. And you'll note I've already got the IP address configured, so that helps. And it's now connected to the PLC. However, this is not by itself going to uh, get my simple device replacement to work. I need to also configure topology. So if I switch to the topology view, here, boy, that's kind of scattered around. And here's my PLC and my I.O. node. And notice none of these are connected at this point. Now, if I'm not using simple device replacement or <clears throat> a specific feature, maybe even SNMP, I probably don't want to configure topology. 
because then if I connect to the wrong port, things will communicate, but I'll get an error message. So I want to make sure that uh, this is a feature that I want. And simple device replacement, such a, a great feature, I would recommend it on any Profinet installation. So the way we are configured, the way I'm physically configured, is port 2 of my PLC. This is port 1. Port 2 is actually connected to port 2 of my ET200SP device. Port 1 of the ET200SP device is connected to port 1 of my switch. So there we go. That's configured. And that's all I need to do for simple device replacement to work. I will, however, go ahead and add one feature, and that is, uh, I mentioned it earlier, prioritize startup. This will speed up the startup of a node, and this is based upon your PLC's um, technical specs, how many devices will it support. Typically, our PLCs will support 64 prioritized startup devices. So now I select the PLC, download. It is going to stop the PLC. Now, a programming change would not, but this is a configuration change. So the configuration change will stop the PLC. <coughs> Excuse me. And it is downloaded. So now if I select the PLC, go online, I want to notice, again, a red X here. Now, this is topology, so right now we have a problem with this link. If I switch to the network view, I'll see that the XB208 is not reachable. And the reason, you may be thinking already of this, is that I have not assigned the device name. So I'll go into Assign Device Name. This time I select the XB208 switch, update my list, and I'm going to see a device with uh, no name and no IP. No name? It does have an IP, actually. Uh, would normally not have one, but I had assigned one earlier. But that is not the IP that we want. I don't have to worry about that. I'm just going to assign the name. So now the IP gets assigned. And on this end, I want to see everything go green. And it did. And if I update the list, you'll see the new IP address within the PLC. Or, sorry, within the, uh, the XB208. And there it is, 15.30. And there we go. It took a second to update. And green checks everywhere. Everything is online. If I switch to the topology view, everything is good to go. So the question is, is it really working? The... Um, the automatic or simple device replacement. So what I'm going to do on this end is I'm going to disconnect the cable from the PLC to the ET200SP. Obviously when I do that, that's going to disconnect him from the node. And then I'm going to factory reset the node so that it has nothing in it. So I'll just go ahead and disconnect the cable. Okay, so there the PLC is down. I'm still online with the PLC right now. I'm connected to the PLC directly. So I'm going to switch that so that I can connect to the, the I.O. node and then do a reset. So I'll go offline with the PLC. So I'll scroll down here to, there's a couple of places for me to do this, but I'm going to expand the online access area within Portal project tree. This is the adapter that I am using to connect to the network. I'm going to update accessible devices. <coughs> and there I will see my ET200SP node. So I'm now going to double click the online and diagnostics and perform. You can do firmware updates here as well. I want to do a full factory reset on the node. So now if I come back over to Update Accessible Devices, I'm going to see that the node is just simply sitting there with no name in it and no IP address. So there it is. 
There's the node, accessible device, no IP address and no name. So what I'm going to do is go back online with the PLC and then plug the device back in. So I switched my cabling so I could be online with the PLC and you can see the device is still offline. Now I'm going to plug the device in. So this is a brand new factory reset device. It is plugged in and actually over here it is already back up and online and there it is. So that is a really powerful feature so if that module had to be replaced on third shift for instance Simply replace the module, plug the cable back in, and it is back up. And that was accomplished via topology and a 200 level switch or higher. The XB or XC200 switches would be ideal. And to verify that we really are cooking with gas, I'm going to run the simulator on the HMI again so you can see that. I don't believe I updated the topology view here, so I will bring in a new topology screen. Well, I guess I won't. Let's take a look at that. So this was simply a view. We'll, we'll get to that in the next section. So here we are, topology, hit the node, just to prove that we're back up. So there's my push button, and it's running well. So that's a very powerful feature, simple device replacement. I recommend it on any ProPNet installation. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned the uh, next step was system diagnostics. So this is uh, pretty painless. A um, couple of things I'll configure. Make sure I'm offline with the PLC. Not much sense in trying to make config changes online. First thing I want to do that I haven't done, I don't have to enable system diagnostics. It's already built in. But I do want to turn on the web server. So here's the web server, activate, and you can, by the way, make it only viewable with an HTTPS connection, which would be encrypted, and in that case, when you open your browser, you will have to retrieve the certificate from the PLC, which is a pretty secure way of doing things. Um, you have to be connected to it to get the certificate, <coughs> but it's not quite... Um, what we would do if we were online with the bank, but it does give us encryption so that uh, someone on the network could not see the traffic back and forth. I'm not doing that at the moment, just wanted to cover it. Now user management. I'm going to add a user and give this user full access. You can see some of the things you can do. Uh, read and write files, flashy LEDs, backup and restore the CPU. And we'll give it a password. <clears throat> so that's all I wanted to add to the PLC. I do want to enable a couple of diagnostic events on the I.O. nodes or node. So for starters, I'm going to select the interface module and select group diagnostics. So anytime I have a missing supply voltage. Now the way the ET200SP nodes work when you see a white base, we are introducing a potential. Anytime you see a new white base, we've disconnected the previous potential from the left and introduced a new one to carry on downstream. When you see the darker base, it is receiving its potential from the left. So in our example here, if we disconnect one of these, we should get a potential error or message within our system diagnostics. Additionally, I'm going to disconnect power from this module. So I want to uh, 
pad and no supply voltage diagnostic men. You can see some of the possible events we can get just out of this analog input module. So for now, just a supply voltage. So I should get a message from the CPU or the, I'm sorry, the interface module. I should also get a message from the analog input module. And that is all part of the PLC's configuration. By <clears throat> enabling this diagnostic event when power is disconnected from this module, I will also get a red light on the module. And I will also see it on the face of the CPU. So I can fish right through that menu and see it. So I will go ahead and because I'm making a change here, I like to hardware rebuild all, just not necessary normally, I just kind of a belt and suspender approach. I'm going to download to the PLC. Again, that will stop the CPU because it is a configuration change. The web server as well as the the I.O. node had a change. Now on the HMI, I have a couple of things I want to add. So on the um, screens, I'm going to add a screen, name it, and we'll call this alarm view. And then I'm going to add a screen, name it, and we will call this system diagnostic. So there are my two screens. Additionally, I think on my global screen I did not have it set. We'll see here. I do actually. Okay. So within the HMI there is one thing I have to set. I double click on my runtime settings. Select alarms. I need to select S7 diagnostic alarms with event text and also view the system diagnostics. So those checkboxes are all that we require on the HMI settings. And those screens should now work. Now because I added those screens, it would make sense to make a way to navigate. So what I've been using is the left slide-in screen. And I'm going to add a couple of buttons to get to those screens. Copy-paste. And I'm going to say this one is going to go to, instead of topology screen, we'll go to the alarm view. Drag that in, and then I can name it with a piece of text. In my case, I'm going to use a graphic, and I've already created one of these. Don't I have anyway? Uh, I will just go ahead and call it. View, copy paste, and we'll call this one System Diagnostic, and we'll change the screen that we navigate to. And just to kind of clean things up, I'll drop the font size on him a little bit so he fits. I'll evenly space these guys. Okay. So now if I select my HMI, turn on the simulator, connection established. So here I see my alarm view is, oh, I didn't put anything on it. <laughs> Back up a step. That would help. On the alarm view, I can't just name the screen. I actually have to put the alarm view object. So we'll drop the alarm view in. And just size that the way I want it. And then on the properties of the alarm view, I don't like uh, the unacknowledged alarms, but there are instances where I might use those. I'm going to go ahead and create those events. I'll go ahead and check those events of diagnostics and acknowledge, no acknowledge. That will allow me to see the system diagnostic events in this particular alarm view. And I'm going to get rid of the things I don't want. I just want maybe the time and the text. 
That's good enough. Just the info text and we'll get into info text here in a minute so there's the alarm view configured system diagnostic view is actually even simpler grab this stethoscope looking icon drop that onto my screen and there's the system diagnostics view so now, if I open up my HMI simulator, see there's my splash screen, no events at the moment. Switch to the alarm view, nothing's going on. System diagnostic, nothing is going on, it's just happy. So I'm going to do something simple, like uh, we can disconnect a node. There you can see I.O. device not found. So if I look at my alarm view message, you can see I.O. device not found. I have some additional errors because I have topology configured. And there's the device that's missing, the XP208-JW. So that's why that name is pretty helpful, among other things. And then if I switch to the system diagnostic, I could actually follow the error and then see that my device is missing. The whole thing is missing. Also, if I switch to the web server, log in, and it's going to give me a message saying this is unsafe because it's not safe, and then uh, here we go. So now we go to, for instance, the topology. You see we're missing the information here. We're missing the, the node. I could click here or go to module information. And this looks just like the diagnostic view. Follow the errors. And there I have missing ET200S. IO device failure. IO device not found. So I'll restore the device. And the web server seems to be the slowest in coming back to life. It's already back on this guy. Topology. We're going to add some configuration here in a minute to make that a little more interactive. And the alarm view is clear. So back here, everything's happy again. So next, I'm going to disconnect power from slot 3. All right, so now I have two errors, as I mentioned. One is saying I have the entire interface module is telling me I have a load group, uh, load voltage failure in load group starting at slot 3. And here in the analog module, it actually tells me the supply voltage is missing for that particular module. So if I followed system diagnostics, which again, if you remember, I did no configuration at all for system diagnostics on this screen. I just dropped the object out there. Follow the error. And here it is. I'm not sure why the text doesn't show up here, but at least it leads me to the module as well as the order number and the address. And if I come back to, say, the topology view, it's going to show that there's an error on this node. This time, instead of clicking module info, I'll click the module right in the topology view. Follow the 200 SP node. And here is the detail. Error supply voltage missing. So. All of this information is readily available. It's on the HMI. It's in the uh, Step 7 software. It's on the web server. It's also on the face of the PLC. So now I'm going to reland the voltage. Everything is physically happy here. Everything is back to happy on this side and communicating. The alarm view has no more messages. And then I should have all green on the web server. So there was uh, system diagnostics uh, shown without anything too special done. Pretty painless. So now <coughs> the next piece of this would be some program diagnostics.
So what if I want to know which node dropped off uh, in the PLC? Maybe I want to enunciate from the PLC or even act upon that. Uh, additionally, I can even turn nodes on and off from the PLC. So what I want to do is uh, add a little more information, maybe create my own screen that would lead me to some information on the PLC um, as far as the nodes that are lost or what might be going on with those nodes. So again, I go back to the library because I have pre-configured a block, but I'll show you how that works. So where's my system diag program diagnostics? So I'm going to add in program blocks, and what I've created is a group of programming blocks, which is just two, really. One is really the tag container, which is how I term a data block. It has the tags necessary. And then the second uh, is the actual block that uh, does the work, the programming, the logic. I'm also going to add HMI tags to my HMI. If I can get back to the tags area, it's make me scroll. <coughs> Have a couple more tags configured. And then I'm going to change the topology screen. And I'll show you what uh, what we've done on the topology screen. So we'll start with the PLC. That's where the work takes place. So in the PLC block, FC2, PN device status is what I named it. I use a block called device states. This is built in to the PLC, um, to, to the actual instruction set, I should say. And this, this block will allow me to get uh, the status of a node, for instance, if it is available. Additionally, and I could do this multiple times, call this block multiple times, find out if the slave is faulty, uh, if it's just been disabled, uh, if it exists, uh, or any ones that uh, might have a particular problem occurring. So that's all within this block, and I can change the mode to change what I'm looking for. In this case, all I'm trying to do is find out if the device is present and online. So this block takes care of that. Now that's populating the information in this array. So this array says device 1, device 2, device 3, on down the line are either present or not present. And the device number is actually part of my Profinet setting. So if I were to look at my node, for instance, ET200SP, I can see the device number right here. So there's a unique device number built into your configuration as well. <coughs> so what we've done is gone ahead and added on the topology screen if the device is online or offline. So it's just a simple um, graphical object. And what I configured within this guy is a graphic list that says, OK, if if uh, the the value from a particular tag comes back as a 1, I show a green check as a 0, I show a red X, or a red cir cir circle with an X in it. So if I select that object, that's actually what we call a graphic I.O. field. It's looking at the Profinet device state for 1, and then it's going to be, of course, green or red, depending on that state. And I added also uh, what we call a symbolic I.O. field, which is essentially a text list doing the same thing. So now if I go online with my HMI, and actually I need to download my PLC first because I added those blocks. So it's going to drop in, should drop in function 2, as well as the uh, db4. Actually, there's one more piece of this. I forgot. I didn't call the block FC2. So now to call it, I open up my main routine. For those familiar with Siemens, that's the same as a Rockwell main routine. It's a continuous routine. So any block that you call has to either be called from OB1 or a block called from OB1. Uh, although there are some other ways, signal interrupts and hardware interrupts, where we can do things. But for now, we'll stick with a continuous. 
So now FC2 will get called from OB1. And now I can drop in my programming changes. And that did not take me offline. Now if I select my HMI and open up simulator, I should get some good information here. So now when I go to topology, it tells me my two devices are online. I disconnect my switch. See the switch now went offline. I also got my, my message. It says IO device failure. Um, mentions that specific device. Uh, and then I'll plug that guy back in. Back online and I'll do the same thing for the node. So now the node is offline and also lost the switch. Now notice that because of my topology the PLC is chained to the switch through this node. Now that's probably not the way I would normally configure it. But because this is a downstream device, the XB208, when I lost connection to the, to the node I also lost connection to the switch. So that's the the issue with a linear or a bus type topology. And and everything's back. So there's where I program some diagnostics to pick up the device status. So we're inching towards uh, more information here on our screen. And that was uh, just a simple, simple indicator. Now additionally, we can program our own alarms, which we have not done. And I'll add that in following the next couple of steps here. So I'm going to switch back to presentation for a moment. And we're going to touch on, just briefly, uh, Ethernet topologies. And then, of course, we'll demonstrate the ring. <coughs> kind of an old slide, but we've got bus topologies. We might drop uh, from the bus. This would probably be more of a plant view. Star is very common in our arrangement, and that would be where maybe everything has a connection to a switch or even switches uh, hybrid where we do a, a switch to a switch which is also extremely common and then there's a, a tree uh, here's a line topology and this is where we've essentially connected a switch to a switch to a switch and you see what happens if I lose this cable Then I have, uh, of course, what happens if the cable gets broken? Kind of Captain Obvious here, we've lost communication to an entire cell. So now from our PC standpoint, which could be a SCADA or a programming software, we can communicate with two of the three lines, but only two. So a superior approach in a situation like this would be a ring topology. So in this case, I have multiple PLCs, and I'm going to communicate to all of those, and I'm going to construct a ring. Now if I lose a segment, then I still maintain communication. So how do I build this in the portal? Well, this is what I'm, we're going to configure now. So we're going to configure from PLC to switch, switch to the I.O. node, and then from the I.O. node back to the PLC. So now if we lose this cable, for instance, will still communicate to the PLC, to the node uh, back directly from the uh, PLC back to the node. And then, of course, we lose this cable to the switch. We'll communicate through the node back to the switch. So we'll have communication either way. So the next step, we've got to configure the ring topology. So I'm going to switch back to the portal view.
and we're going to add in a configuration for a ring. So again, to, to be efficient, I have pre-configured, and I will show you, you know, what I've pre-configured, and we'll just drop it in blindly. So change the topology screen. So I'm going to close up the program diagnostic library, the folder within the library, open up my ring folder. So drop that in. And here's just a graphical view, really, of what we have configured. At this point, I've still not made any of this interactive that would tell me when a particular cable or segment is down. We will add that in the following section. But at this point, we're just going to add the ring. So if I double click on devices and networks, again, there's lots of ways to get to and from. We're going to add to the topology, we've got to close this ring. So we're going to connect port 2 of my switch over to port 1 of my PLC. And now I have my ring configured. One thing I would warn you on is make sure that you have downloaded the ring settings to the devices before you physically make the connections. Because if you physically make the ring connection before you've added settings to let the devices know the ring is coming, you will end up with a loop that will freeze up all communication. So I'm going to select my PLC, select right on the port, advanced options. Again, there are multiple places to do this. I'm going to select media redundancy. So right now there is no ring configured. I want to make the PLC the manager. And he only has two ports, so those will be his ring ports. I select domain settings. I could also do this directly at the devices. I want to get the parameters for this domain, this ring domain. It's actually the network domain, which includes a ring. So down here within the MRP settings, I'm going to add the ET200SP to the, the ring. I'm going to say, well, that's a client. And again, I can't change the port settings because I only have two ports on that device. The XB208, now I'm going to add that device as a client. Now here I could change the ports, and it's important which ports I select. I want to make sure I get these correct. Port 1 and 2 are the ports we're using, so those are correct for the ring participation. But I could make those obviously any one of the eight ports, or any two of the eight ports. So now my ring is configured. So I will go ahead and select PLC and perform the download. And again, that will stop the CPU because it is a configuration change. Now the PLC is faulted but should still be communicating to the node. It is, but it is faulted because we're missing this cable. So I'm going to reconnect my cables correctly. And I should see green lights here on the PLC. I do. And if I go online, I will see all green lights. Topology view is all green. So again, if I disconnect one of my cables, topology view will reflect that, but I still maintain communication. I'll reconnect that. So this might be better shown from the HMI. So I'll select HMI runtime again. Topology. Again, I have not made these cables interactive. But now that I, I disconnect one, I'm going to get two faults. And the reason is both devices are reporting faults because both devices lost their connection. So if I select the XB208, there I see port 2 is down. And on the PLC, port 1 is down. 
However, when I push my button, I've still got communication to the node. If I look at my web server, I go to topology, and I'm going to have to log in again. You'll see a cycle. Here I see the full ring, and again, I've lost, lost this connection. So now I'll reland that one. You'll see that error should go away. Yep, it did. Again, I've never lost comms here. Still communicating. See my push button. And now I will disconnect another cable. And again, I did not go offline. But if I look at the alarm view again, Lost port 2 on the 200SP node, and I lost um, port 2 on the PLC, which is directly connected. However, still maintaining I.O. communication, and you can see on the topology, restore this guy, but lost this one. So, the ring is very, um, very reliable. Now, even though the ring is reliable, we still have the situation where if we had a cable break, we would need to enunciate that, show it on an HMI, or even send a message from a PLC to let maintenance or whomever know that we've got a broken cable and we need to go fix it. So that is the next step. We need to pull some information out of our switches. And I say switches, the ET200SP node has a switch built in, the 1500 has a switch built in, and of course the XP208. So our next step is to pull some diagnostics out of that device. I'll go ahead and close the network back in. And we should be back up no no more messages here, and a whole topology again. So switch views for a moment again. And we'll talk briefly about SNMP. So our, our switches and our PLCs and uh, actually, in this case, um, the uh, ET200SP node as well, or what we call an SNMP agent. And then the PLC in this case is going to be an SNMP management station. And the management station can then pull data. Uh, it's actually a UDP IP message from, from the SNMP agent. Now, that involves a, a, a set of strings that's going to get sent to that device um, in a UDP IP message, and, and certainly it would be a little tedious to create that code. But Siemens has some sample code that uh, gives you a basic set of SNMP messages, and then from there we can use that to you know, pull the data out of our device as we want. So that's what I've done in my program. And some of the information we can get is the monitoring of the network components, uh, diagnostics. What I'm keying in on is port status. And that, um, that's the guy that's going to give us the piece that we need. So I head back to TIA portal and we'll add in the SNMP piece. Again, I'm using my library. I'm going to bring over my program blocks, which uh, we'll look at those. It's essentially just a, a folder where I have an SNMP logic routine that calls the SNMP block. And I've created some tag containers, and then there's some basic instance data blocks that we're going to use with this call. So it's really kind of takes care of itself. But if you get to the point where you want to utilize this logic, feel free to contact me, and I can send you some information on it and walk you through it with uh, the blocks we've already developed here. 
So here I'm just simply doing an SNMP read-write function. In my instance, I'm really just doing a, a read of diagnostic data. And then doing a little bit of alarming here. So here I'm saying if the, the ring segment 1 is up, we'll flag this bit. And if it is not up, then uh, we're going to drop that bit. And then we're going to use that to trigger a couple of alarms over in the HMI. So over in the HMI, we can say, all right, we have the segment is down. We'll hit an alarm trigger tag that then gives me an alarm message in my alarm view. So we'll look at that as well. But I'm going to use these bits, whether the segment is good or not, and I created three, segments one, two, three, to give me some visualization for my HMI. So I've dropped in the SNMP routine. I now need to call the SNMP routine. And that is done. There's no extra configuration necessary. And I'm simply going to download the PLC. I normally would not have stopped the PLC, but I made a change while I was <clears throat> in between slides there. Okay, so that's downloaded. Now I'm going to drop in new tags over in the HMI, just updated tags really, to connect to those SNMP tags. And we'll see here that I have Proofing at device state, high state, so here's my two states, and then the segment status down here as well, as well as this alarm trigger tag. And I'm going to bring over the topology. <coughs> now if you look at the topology screen, this has been changed now. So if you look at this line segment, for instance, I have animations configured so that when the segment status is a zero, the line will switch to, to red. When the segment status is a one, we'll switch to green. And additionally, I added a little indicator here to indicate the segment is good or bad. So those will now be live indications that very much match my topology view. Again, I'm pulling that information with the SNMP blocks to get SNMP data out of my switch and my node. PLC actually. And then I'm going to double click on HMI alarms. Yeah, I believe I have this set somehow. I created too many of them. Alarms, segment one alarm, segment two, segment three. The text will say ring segment one is down. I've added to each alarm info text. This info text will say check cable connection of port PLC port 2, ET200 SP no port 2. So it just gives a little extra information to the operator, and I'll show you how you invoke that on the alarm view. There's really nothing else we have to do in our configuration. We'll just do it. So this should be ready to go. Fire up the alarm simulator, and we'll do a little cable when we get in. <clears throat> so there's the topology, and I actually have live segment looks now. So I'll kill a cable. There's our indication. Ring segment down, so we see association showing visually. Additionally, if I look at my alarm view, I'll see this is these are the two system diagnostic messages that were generated automatically. 
it tells me that port 1 of my XP 208s uh, down as well as port 1 of the ET 200 SP and then my message here is ring segment 2 if I select that message and my help there's the info text I configured check cable connection at ET 200 SP node port 1 of course obviously you can put whatever text you want there but you could even give a little more specific location information for that alarm so I'll go ahead and fix that cable And let's go back to the topology view. That looks good. And we'll break the cable between the processor and the node. There we go. That cable's down. Same story. I go over to my alarm view. Select help, and there's my information. Then here's my additional info here. And bring that back to life, and there she is. So all of that information is now much more usable, and I have some actual worthwhile SNMP info. So with that, that is the, the end of the webinar. If you do have questions, please flag us there and uh, we'll get to those here shortly.